Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a returning guest, uh, Dr. Sandy Bavakwa. Dr. Sandy has a PhD in molecular and cellular biology. Uh, she's worked as a research scientist in both university and government settings, and she's lectured to the public and to medical professionals around the world since 1986, so many, many decades. And I have her back to uh, talk about her insights on cancer for the cancer book that we're putting together. So, Sandy, thanks for coming back. You're very welcome. I'm happy to be here. Well, good. Tell me, just to refresh listeners that may not have heard last time, tell me a bit about your background, and then we'll get into the cancer questions. Well, actually, I my interest in uh, human tumor biology goes way back. And in fact, that's what my uh, dissertation was all about. My, I have a over 500 page dissertation that includes several publications on molecular changes that occur within human tumor cells as they develop the ability to what's called extravasate or to um, pass through basement membranes. So it's the, it is the thing that has to happen with, for a tumor to be able to spread or metastasize. It has to get across the barriers of the body. And as a graduate student and a postdoctoral candidate, that was uh, my primary focus was to uh, determine changes that occur uh, in the cells. What, you know, what does a cell, a tumor cell need to be able to do to be able to spread through the body? And I worked with several different types of human tumor, but uh, primarily I did work on uh, human melanoma which is it, because it's very, very metastatic. It's really able to do that very well. Oh, so what did you notice in your dissertation? Why, um, you picked melanoma, it, you know, it spreads quite a bit. So what did you notice happens? I've, I've heard of like an epithelial to mesenchymal transition, but you know, what did you notice when you did it? Well, there's um, three major events that happen with the melanoma cells to be able to be successful at spreading around the body. And I did work also with colon cancer and breast cancer. And I was a part of a program going on at the, um, the cancer center. I was working with Sydney Salmon uh, for a short period of time, who was the head of the cancer center. And uh, this was like a sideline thing. But what we were doing was literally, I'd be right there at the surgery, getting little bits of a person's tumor. And if I was lucky, I could get a little bit of the normal cells as well. And I, you know, sometimes the surgeon would slap my wrist and say, no, the patient needs that. But if I was lucky, I could get a little bit of the normal and the tumor. And I'd run back to the lab, tease apart the cells and grow them in the laboratory and look to see what would be the best way to treat that particular cancer. 
And it was a very, very successful program. Now, uh, of course, most of the treatments that we were looking at back then were uh, chemotherapy drugs, but we were able to identify what combination was gonna be most effective because we, in very short periods of time, we could look at the what would kill that person's tumor much more rapidly. And this is something that's very, very important. Individualized treatment is a big deal. And that is what's, that's, going to be the wave of the future is being able to take care of each person as an individual and not like everybody else is being treated. Quick question. What did you notice was different though about the different tumors you sampled? Each tumor has its own personality. They're completely different from each other. I mean, some of the breast and, and colon cancer cells would make strands. I mean, this is how weird it would get. Like some tumors want to make a tumor. They want to make a ball of cells. Whereas other, some tumors would would make little tiny hairs, very long, like a like the finest hair uh, that would be only maybe two or three cells uh, wide, and it would some of them would grow right out of the petri dish. I mean, it was amazing. They were spreaders, and they would grow these little yeah hair like extensions from the main tumor. But also the big thing that I noticed is that there was a huge difference in the needs of the normal cells versus the tumor cells. Uh, normal cells required a lot of nutrition. They needed a lot of oxygen. They wanted a, a very normal pH to the medium around them. Um, they couldn't handle a lot of acidity or, or waste, whereas the tumor cells would do incredibly well at a more acid pH with less nutrition, less oxygen. In many, many of the conditions tumor cells needed, were very different than what the uh, what the normal cells needed, and that made it very poor science. Because you know, I used to call my cell cultures my babies, and taking care of each baby was completely different if I was going to keep them happy. They all have their personalities. The normal cells and the tumor cells were very different, and the different tumors from each person was very different. You know, this was back in the old days where we we could actually name the tumor. Uh, cell line by the patient's name. Now you can't do that. So I would have, you know, Mrs. Peterson and Mr. Nor Noriega, and, you know, I'd have different names to my cells from the patient. And they all, all of them, even with a very similar type of tumor, acted differently. Well, when you so, say differently, how differently? So if it was the same kind of cancer, how different would the tumors act and look? So one tumor, like I said, might grow these hair-like fibrous extensions. Another one would not. One would get extremely, uh, one would have a higher metabolic rate than another. So they would produce more waste. And in some cases, the ones that produced more more waste or had a higher metabolic rate actually grew more rapidly in the presence of more waste. And more waste usually meant a more acid environment. So the more acid the environment got, the more they would grow. So these sorts of things. But let me go back to the answer of the first question you asked, which will help you with the last question you asked. You were asking about what do the tumor cells need to be able to do? Like why, I mean, the melanoma cells, and even though melanoma from different people would act differently, all the cells needed to do three major things. One was that they needed to be able to attach themselves to the basement membranes that act as the, ba as the, uh, as the barriers in the body. So every blood vessel you've got, every organ you have, every space in the body has a, has a basement membrane around it. And what I did was I devised a, a device that allowed for me to watch the cells doing this. It was kind of like, if you can imagine, a block of plexiglass. And I cut the block in half, but then perpendicular to that, there were holes drilled through the first uh, piece of plexiglass and partway into the second. And it gave me a surface that I could stretch a basement membrane across. And what I did was I used to run up to, to uh, labor and delivery and go get women's placentas. And I would go get the, the basement membrane off of the outside of the placenta, denude it from its uh, epithelial cells, stretch it across, and put medium in the device that I had so that I could put cancer cells in the top and measure their ability to break through the basement membrane into the bottom chamber. And so what they have to do is they have to attach to the membrane. And that meant, uh, for instance, I was looking at the, um, the ability to produce laminin receptors on the surfaces of the cell membrane of the tumor cells to be able to latch on 
to the basement membrane. Now, the next thing they needed to do was to produce enzymes to break a hole in the basement membrane so that they could get through. And uh, so looking at the production of enzymes was something I was doing. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. And the other thing was, in order to get through a basement membrane, they had to produce motility factors to be able to wiggle their way through the, the little hole that they just made. And sometimes it was only a tiny hole, so they had to really squeeze through. And they would wiggle through and make their way to the other chamber. But in the body, that would be getting into the bloodstream. And then from the bloodstream, lodging in a capillary bed somewhere, like the brain, the liver, lungs, and then breaking back through another hole to be able to make a tumor in the new spot. So that's what's needed for metastases. And the different individual tumors that I worked with, some were really good at one thing, but not at the other. So they weren't good metastasizers. But the ones that could do all three of those tasks really well, those were the ones that would metastasize like crazy. So there was different tasks and different ability to express the genes to be able to achieve those tasks. Yeah, what um, it seems like cancers have tropisms for, you know, for metastatic sites. They have preferential metastatic sites in certain tissues, depending on the cancer. Did you observe that or based on your observations, in addition to going through a basement membrane, how and why do the cancer cells seem to prefer certain spikes, uh, sites to go to? It may be, uh, okay, I wasn't watching in situ responses. Uh, so I wasn't working in an animal model for the most part. Um, I, what I was, but we could always look at the outcome for a particular patient. But of course, what we were doing was trying to, we were in the process of developing anti-metastatic agents, which actually exist right now. How do those work, anti-metastatic agents? Not my thing. I mean, I didn't do, I haven't done that research, but the research that I did do contributes now with a body of, of evidence to the facilities that are making anti-metastatic agents. So yeah, that that's happening. But going back to tropism, I think it, it has a lot to do with, you know, it's like, why would one cell be able to turn on a gene? Like we all have genes for laminin receptors. We all have genes to make motility factors. All of our cells have those genes. But why would one cell turn them on uh, or one tumor be able to turn that on rather than another? And I don't know the answer to that. It may have to do with what the uh, toxic status is of a person. I mean, I do a lot of toxin testing in my in my office. I mean, we a lot of people have their environmental toxins, heavy metals, uh, mycotoxins uh, tested. We look for glyphosate and we also do organic acid testing to see which of the organic acid pathways are working well and which ones are not. And I also do a lot of genetic analysis as, as well as we can do in this early time of gene analysis. But uh, as a culmination, what I find is that uh, people have tremendous toxic load in their bodies. Uh, most people are carrying something and uh, at very high levels. And it seems to correlate with their inability to get rid of that class of chemical rather than their, you know, sometimes people will report, oh yes, I was exposed to pesticides and herbicides. In fact, I remember dancing with all the neighborhood kids behind the DTT truck that used to go through the, the, our area, you know, spraying DTT all over the place. So we used to play in the cloud behind the truck. It's like, yeah. So, you know, people sometimes will have a memory or, you know, a work event that tells me that they have had a serious exposure to a chemical, but most people don't. 
Most people do not have an event that they can remember of chemical exposure, but what they do have is a genetic track record of mutations that interferes with either phase one or phase two detoxification pathways that kind of break uh, the organic acid pathways that keeps them from being able to get rid of certain classes of chemicals. And so that person then becomes, uh, develops very high levels of carcinogens that I believe are contributing to the, the cancers that they're developing. What, what are some of the, uh, the common uh, contaminants people have, or are they, you know, have you seen enough people where you see a commonality or are they all different? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Uh, there, each person is going to be very different, but I'm definitely seeing a lot of the petroleum, uh, like the, the chemicals that are being used to uh, increase our octane, the, the high octane ratings, see a lot of ocratoxin and uh, mycophenolic acid as far as the, the uh, mold toxins. And citronin, citronin is another big one. And that causes a lot of neurological problems. As far as heavy metals go, I see a lot of lead, a lot of mercury, and a surprising amount of like palladium, uh, uranium, and uh, some occasionally I'll see a really high aluminum level. Everybody has glyphosate in them, the Roundup. Uh, but glyphosate is not, it's not a big surprise because glyphosate has been found in every air space on the earth. So Roundup is in the air everywhere. Um, wow, really? It's going but, over the whole earth? Like Teflon, I guess, right? But I'm going to say, like, as far as the carcinogens go, we see a lot of gasoline additives, like the MTBE and the ETBE. These are compounds that are in groundwater contamination, but they're also in the air. And if you get skin exposure to gasoline, you can take it in very, very easily. And I can't tell you, I mean, almost, I'm going to say 80% of the people I run into have significant amounts of those in them. Everybody has styrene, styrene, ethyl benzene. They're used in the manufacture of plastics, but people generally, I mean, when I was a kid, nobody was careful about putting a hot drink into a styrofoam cup or, or taking food home in a styrofoam container. And that's really a bad idea. Styrofoam, but gonna, and also styrene now is used as a quote unquote natural additive. It's a natural sweetener for creamy foods like um, like yogurts. And you know, if it says natural sweetener or that's natural, horrible. I know, I know. But you know what? The uh, petroleum industry has to get rid of that styrene and they do it by putting it into food. So yeah, sorry, but true. Acrylamide is also a carcinogen that I'm finding in a lot of people. You know, not so much the propylene oxide. I don't see that in a lot of people. I do find people with a lot of organophosphates in them. So mostly from pesticides. Uh, so pesticides, uh, the herbicides, Probably uh, the 2,4-dichlorophenol uh, oxalic acid, um, that is pretty common. I see that one. Uh, acrolein. Acrolein is by far more prevalent. It's almost as bad as glyphosate. And what if you were able to uh, do an experiment where you exposed various tumor cells to all these known contaminants and see how they grow and how it affects them. I think they already have been. That's why they're growing. No, right? I know, but has right. anyone done right. this in a, in a, you know, a scientific experiment in the lab well, to these... see, depending on the contaminants, how it affects various types of cancer tumor cells? Well, I think, I mean, the, there are animal studies that are being done where the animal is getting exposed to these chemicals and then we look to see how carcinogenic it is. But acrolein, for instance, is more associated with diabetes and insulin resistance. So you're going to see unstable blood sugar and some of the mental challenges that people have as a result of that one. But when we go back to the acrylamide, acrylamide is a known carcinogen. We know it causes cancer. And same thing with the gasoline additives that I mentioned. They are carcinogenic. And uh, triglycine is another one. I see that in a lot of people. And that's associated with cancer, Parkinson's disease, and autism. So, you know, we're living in a cesspool these days, and not everyone has an equal ability to be able to process these chemicals out of their body. We all have dozens and dozens of detoxification mechanisms or little 
think of them as biochemical machines that are working in the body. And these machines need nutrition to be able to function. So for each individual to be able to get rid of things, they have to have pathways that actually work. And some people don't have very strong pathways, whereas other pathways are very strong and work well. But I think the, the bottom line, the big problem is we're living in a cesspool. We're not being very careful about what we're putting out into the environment. And, you know, it used to be that, that people were exposed to maybe 50 to 100 new chemicals each year. And remember, the chemicals are interacting with each other as well. And nobody's looking at that at all. But now we're seeing upwards of 1,000 to 1,500 brand new chemicals. Many of them are carcinogenic, but these are being released into our air, water, and food uh, out into the environment. We're getting exposed to them, and they're coming out faster than we can even develop the tests to be able to test for them. It's, it's bad. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, well, it, it's amazing. Again, has, has, anyone, has anyone been able to correlate the various contaminants with their specific effects on these tumors? And would that be useful, you think, if an experiment like that was done? I have, in many cases, identified defects or, or mutations in pathways that definitely correlate with a, with a broken pathway that have, has led to the buildup of a particular chemical in a person's body. That's kind of like what I do. I well, what's what's an example of a common pathway? What's the name that you found? And you know, have you have you been able to help one or more people? Like, how, how did they activate that pathway then to reduce their their body burden of a certain chemical? So I don't know. You, I'm sure that you've heard of the cytochrome P450 um, or CYP pathways, right? And I've heard, yes. there's uh, many, many of those pathways. And they are, they're responsible, like, and that you usually, if you want to look them up, it's like CYP1, CYP2, but then there'll be subfamily letters. So there's a CYP1A, CYP2D, you know, these are different pathways. And the cytochrome P450, 3A4 and 3A5, those two uh, are very common pathways. Actually, um, the cytochrome uh, P450 2C9 and 2D6 are also like, these are pathways that are really common that I find that have mutations. And those pathways that I just mentioned, let me see, there's one more that I'll, I'll mention, this uh, cytochrome P452C19. So those five pathways that I mentioned can account for about 80% of the metabolism or the breakdown of the common drugs that are being given to people, okay? So, and even, I mean, genetics on these pathways should be run before we ever give anybody a medication, ever, um, because we don't know how to, uh, let me see, if someone has a broken pathway, it means they can't get rid of that thing very well. In fact, I run into people all the time that cannot process uh, for instance, like um, uh, xenoestrogens. Xenoestrogens are, I, in fact, I just mentioned organophosphates, acrylamide, some of the petroleum distillates. These are xenoestrogens. They look kind of and act like estrogen in the body. And so if, you're, if you have a pathway that doesn't work very well to get rid of that, one of the tricks that I do is to measure people's estrone to estradiol ratio in their blood. Estradiol takes a different pathway from the, this, these chemical pathways I'm mentioning. But estrone actually uses the same pathway that is used by xenoestrogens. And so if you have xenoestrogen buildup in the body, the estrone content in that person, the level in their blood will be higher than their estradiol. Uh, so the ratio will be off. And you know who I see this in? People with reproductive tumors. So reproductive tissue oh. tumors like uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, almost like 99% of the time, it's almost like a given that the estrone will be much higher than the estradiol. It's not, and some of the literature says that estrone is associated with, uh, with reproductive type cancers. It's not the estrone that's the problem. It's the fact that it's just a signal, it's a flag saying that the pathways that are getting rid of estrogen-like chemicals are broken 
and that person is full of some kind of a chemical. So what we do is we go ahead and test them and see what is it that's built up in their system and fix that pathway. How do you fix and, a pathway? What's an example or two of how you do it? Well, for instance, if a pathway, usually pathways have many different steps. So let's say we have a 10-step pathway and we have a mutation at step number three. Well, you could come in maybe at step number six or seven and drop a molecule and the nutrition needed to drive that pathway. And son of a gun, the pathway now works again. So you can, you can supplement that person and make that pathway work. Oftentimes, but not always. Sometimes it's not doable. But, but for the most part, you can fix these detoxification pathways. And there's other ways. There's natural ways that people have been detoxing themselves for ages, like perspiring hot sweats or saunas and uh, colon hydrotherapy and getting into detox baths like Epsom salt baths. There's, there's natural ways that we have of cleansing our body that we've known about for ages that actually work fairly well bypassing the metabolic pathways that I just mentioned. Yeah, that's so really interesting. You don't have to fix the pathway. You can do it a different way. So we have a lot of people that are doing that take on these practices because we can't get the pathway to work very well. So once someone uh, either supplements or somehow upregulates a given pathway, um, are you working with people that have cancer that does it go away or like what happens to the person? What do they notice? I can tell you that I'm a, a team member of the, serving individuals that have had cancer and that have completely regressed their cancer, that usually the things that I do are not the only things that they have done. So I'm not going to take like 100% credit. Anybody that's getting well from cancer is hitting it over the head from 20 different directions. You never, ever do just one treatment because cancer is smart. It's figured out how to change its genetic expression and continues to do so in may, many cases where it's changing its genes such that it gets around whatever you're treating with. So you have to hit it over the head from several different directions. And for instance, one of the things that I encourage people with cancer to do is to have testing done to see what their, their tumor is sensitive to and what it's not. And there's a company out there called RGCC. It's not the only company that's doing this, but I love their results because when it's used to produce that person's program, they generally get better. And what, so what they're doing is uh, they take a blood sample from that person who does not in the at least 10 days have any chemo in their system. And you can find circulating tumor cells. And what they do at RGCC is they test them against dozens and dozens of different chemo agents, immune, immune agents, or you know, like immunotherapy type agents, and natural components. There are literally hundreds of herbs that cause apoptosis or uh, stop angiogenesis. Now, apoptosis is when cells naturally just up and die. For instance, when you were a baby, your hands and feet developed like little paddles. And, and sometime in your development, tissue in between your fingers and toes instantly died or pretty close to instantly. It, the apoptotic, apoptotic genes turned on and those cells died and you were left with fingers and toes. So we can turn on apoptosis in cancer cells with natural components. And uh, there's other types of herbs and natural molecules that will stop the growth of blood vessels into the tumor. Tumors love to feed themselves. That's another thing that you want to talk about tropisms. I mean, how well does the tumor feed itself? Does it have to go to the liver to get into a lot of blood because it doesn't have the ability to feed itself well? Or does it, or can it be in, you know, uh, can it be in solid bone or can it be in, in some tissue that doesn't have a lot of blood supply? The, can, it, can it handle that because it can grow its own blood vessels? That's angiogenesis, the, uh, the genesis of new blood vessels. And there are herbs and natural uh, nutrients that can stop that process. So when somebody goes and has their tumor cells tested to see which of those components are going to work best for them, what then I can do is help them by producing a, a rotation program where they're rotating through natural uh, substances so the tumor never gets used to any one of them. It can't. We don't give it enough time. And, uh, and that is effective. So you can, have, you can have 12 to 20 different ways you're hitting that cancer over the head, and that's how you get successful.
that's how yeah. you uh, cause tumors to regress. What are the common ways that uh, you'll use with patients? You said you got to hit it a bunch of different ways. So, you know, what are some of the things that you do and what are some of the things the patient has to do on their own? But what are the top, let's say, three things that you always do that seems to work, but, you know, other factors may be needed as well? With that disclaimer. I'll, I'll tell you, I encourage every single person that if they're coming to me for nutritional advice of around their cancer, and I, you know, I basically come onto their team as a biochemist. That's my job. Um, so I'm not an MD. I can't be their oncologist. I'm the biochemist, and and I work with their other healthcare providers. So I am going to be the person that says, well, let's look at blood chemistry. Let's look at exactly what the needs are, and if they've done RGCC, that is a a boom. For me, because it gives a tremendous amount of data for me to des- uh, to fine tune and design a program for that person. But most people have nutritional deficiencies. Usually, sometimes it's because of their descent. Uh, for instance, people from Eastern Bloc countries and Russia are almost always uh, deficient in their carotenoid, um, so the vitamin A type vitamin, and we see it in their vision, in their skin. Well, and that clears up when we take care of that. Whereas other people don't they have plenty of carotenoids in their system and we don't need to attend to that but low carotenoids would lead to a rapidly uh, progressing tumor uh, the vitamin a type vitamins keep tumors from progressing more rapidly so that's the other thing is knowing what the nutrient does and knowing what the needs of the of each individual is so uh, but looking at antioxidants the different antioxidants uh, for instance well let's call alpha lipoic acid a very important nutrient um, because it's one of the only antioxidants that can get into every space in the body. It can get into the, the to the fatty spaces and the the uh, aqueous spaces. And also, alpha lipoic is going to drive the production of uh, of glutathione in the body, so endogenous production of glutathione. And glutathione, let's call it an antioxidant for now that poses as an amino acid kind of, and but it's really the master detox molecule. So I'm never going to tell someone to not do that unless they have a kind of cancer that is stimulated by glutathione. If that's so, then we can't, we have to stay away from that. Same thing with resveratrol. In many cases, resveratrol from, from red, the, the skin of red grapes, this is a nutrient that can be amazingly uh, helpful in uh, decreasing uh, uh, proliferation of the tumor. But in some people, it can actually stimulate the growth of the cancer. That's why RGCC testing is so important. So it'll tell us which nutrients to use and which ones not to use. But uh, let me see. There's a, a big deal going on right now with sea cucumber. The, a, a sea cucumber, which, you know, it's a little animal, and I, I hope that this is not impacting their population too much, but powdered sea cucumber is just incredible as an anti-cancer agent for many types of solid tumors. It doesn't seem to work with blood tumors, but I'm going to say to you that it, it has anti-angiogenesis factors. It's got apoptotic factors in it. It's anti-proliferative. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and most people respond, most tumors actually are very um, susceptible to its effects. So that's kind of like a go-to sort of a thing. Everybody Everybody that has cancer needs to be attending to the pH of their body, to their immune system, because our immune system knows how to kill cancer. All of our immune systems are taking, we're all getting cancer pretty much, or precancerous events are happening in everyone's body every day, many events, but our immune system knows about this and takes care of it. So having a strong immune system is going to be amazingly helpful because that actually what causes regression. It's the immune system that's cleaning up the tumor. So we want the immune system to be like a peaked out. We want to uh, fine tune it like a sports car. And so that's part of what I do too. I make sure the immune system has everything that it needs unless something is listed that would stimulate that person's type of tumor. And then what else? Detoxification. We already mentioned how important it is. I can't tell you how many people I have met that are working on their third, fourth, even fifth type of cancer. They've survived cancer, 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 different kinds, and they get a different one again. That's because nobody's taking care of the underlying problem. So detoxification is no longer an option. It has to happen in everyone. And honestly, I think that detoxification is is no longer an option 
because of the earth that we've created. What do you mean it's no longer an option? It's just not possible to detox, you mean? Or no, is it a constant it's... battle where you have to check you know, every six months and then adjust, check and adjust? If you want to live to your uh, genetic potential, it's impossible to do so without detoxing on a regular basis. Everyone needs to be detoxing. It's no longer an option. We all need to be doing it. We all need to be at least doing natural things at home or having some, I mean, some people are, are doing some lightweight thing like juicing vegetables, taking in vegetable juice. That's a great idea. And that does bring in nutrients that helps the body get rid of certain types of chemicals and opens up certain pathways. That's a great thing to do. Some people will cleanse their bowels and do like a gentle sort of a thing, you know, enemas, uh, implants, um, doing colonics. These sorts of things are easy enough. There's every town has practitioners that do the um, even massage or exercise. Exercise is a form of detoxification, moving the blood through the soft tissues, uh, staying well hydrated, taking in good food. That's why we need the good food is to be able to feed us so that we have everything we need for our body to function properly. So all of these things I'm talking about, I mean, it might sound like just practicing self-love, getting enough sleep so that your body can get through the uh, metabolic processes. Uh, all of these are important for detoxification, but then not everybody does all of that. And we're, there's no question about the fact that we're, we're all of us. Uh, it used to be that those out in the country, out in the farmland, were in clean environment. And that's not true. The people, the center of cancer in our country is Storm Lake and Cherokee, Iowa. Um, there are four generations, and I, I know of one family, five generations Within the last few years, five generations in one family, some individual of each generation has contracted cancer or was born with cancer. It's unbelievable how much cancer there is in the area. But if you go there, you're going to notice a few things. And I have gone there. I give lectures around the country and I go there. And first of all, the people are very interested in making sure they have no bugs in their house and they have no weeds on their lawn. And they use little flags to indicate to others which chemicals have been sprayed in their immediate, uh, on their property in the recent past. So that people know enough to not walk their dog through that grass or whatever. Um, so they're using herbicides and pesticides, plus they're doing aerial spraying. So there's glyphosate everywhere. The houses are spattered with chemical from the air. Like people's windows are spotted everywhere you go. So is it, a, is it a surprise? Not to me. It's unbelievable how much chemical is in the area. Um, and people are dying left and right of cancer. Well, I guess now the rates of cancer are up to, what, 50% for American men and 33% for American women, which is pretty much insane. Yeah, it's insane. It's insane. And it's, you know, when I was a girl in, uh, in high school, I remember the very first Earth Day. Uh, so I'm, I'm dating myself here. But I remember the first Earth Day and uh, we were told that this would happen and nothing changed. It did happen. Everything that we're seeing with the weather, everything we're seeing with the Earth right now was, we were talking about this back in the 70s. It happened. What, have you noticed that people that have a particular cancer, um, they tend to have more cancers after that? Like, what do you notice in people that, uh, you know, besides body burden of chemicals, are there any other factors that seem to contribute to cancer in people? And again, once they've had it, so they tend to have it over and over again. I. Uh, there's, there's no question about the fact that people tend to get cancer over and over again. And I think that's, that explains a lot of the, I think that there are people that are getting healed, um, but end up getting another incidence of the same kind of cancer or a different kind of cancer because the underlying issue has not been attended to. Uh, I think that happens more often than we know. So, and you know, I maybe I'm seeing more of those people because the people that I see are looking for a different way. So they find me in that way, or they've been referred by their oncologist or something like that. So anyway, I, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that we need to be uh, teaching people that the care of their body has everything to do. I mean, you can't just, oh God, there's the other piece. So people go to their doctor 
and they, the doctor says, oh, you have this kind of cancer and we're going to treat you in X, Y, and Z kind of a way. And it usually means taking, uh, uh, being uh, the recipient of radiation, uh, chemotherapy, or both, maybe surgery as well. And a lot of chemicals come into that person's body. So not only do they have the toxicity of whatever it was that caused the cancer, they also have, and their genetics that could have predisposed them to that. And some of the genetics may have to do with their inability to get rid of the toxins. I hate to repeat myself, but they're also dealing with the toxins and the, the uh, high level of oxidative molecules in their body from the treatments they received, from the radiation and the, and the chemotherapy. So now they're doubly more susceptible. That's why a lot of people that get you know, a lot of radiation end up with leukemia. It's from the, the high amount of oxidation that's going on in their body. So, and, and, but no one ever tells them to go get uh, antioxidant treatments in some way or form um, that can uh, address the aftermath of the treatment that they receive. Nobody detoxes from their chemo. And you know what we can do? Well, I have a lot of people that do this. If, if you tr choose to have the chemotherapy, and in some cases it is appropriate. Some cases people go completely natural and they do well. Some cases they go with chemo, but they detox in between their chemo treatments because most chemotherapy will function. It does its job within hours of receiving it. And so once that, is, that has happened, then you can actually open up that pathway and get rid of it. And then that person is more able, more capable of taking in that medication without having side effects. And then there's other types of things like insulin potentiated, uh, I, uh, let me see, IPT, insulin potentiated therapy. And what that means is uh, in the case of metabolic tumors, uh, so you have a solid tumor, it's uh, many of the solid tumors are metabolic, meaning they're going to use, they have a high metabolic rate and they're going to use a lot more sugar than normal cells. So what you can do is take down that person's blood sugar uh, by using insulin. So it's pretty cheap. Um, they're sitting in a chair, they receive insulin, the blood sugar goes low. Now you can hit with a tiny amount of chemo like one tenth or one twentieth of a normal dose, and if the practitioner is able to, uh, some people are doing IPT, which is just a little bit of time with the insulin and the chemo. Or uh, there's a, a process called Warburg Way now, where you go, uh, you have insulin, and they allow for the patient to sit with the chemo for maybe twenty minutes, thirty minutes, forty minutes if they can do it, where their their blood sugar is low and the cancer cells are sopping up that, that chemo, that tiny amount. And so it's a very small dosage. They get no symptoms from it whatsoever, but it becomes much more effective. And then we can still detox in between their treatments. So, uh, but this becomes a, a safer way of using chemo and not making the person incredibly toxic and having their hair fall out and destroys their gut and blah, blah. Yeah, so, I've never heard anyone talk about detoxing from chemo, just dealing with it and living with it. So what are what are some protocols for detoxing from chemo? How is it done? You remember how I talked about doing genetic analysis and looking to see how well people's pathways are working? We do that. Right, okay. Or the at-home, de detoxing at-home protocols, which I talked about, like I'll design a shake for a person and I take their blood chemistry into account as well. So I'll design a detox shake for them. Maybe we'll do detox baths, uh, maybe lymphatic massage or dry brushing, something to stimulate the lymphatics or lymphatic exercise. Then we'll do the, uh, maybe sauna. Sauna is amazingly effective at getting rid of certain types of chemo. It's really great. And, and the person, as they perspire, if they're able to perspire, it's sometimes the best way to go. And uh, people get like a little sit-down IR sauna. There's little ones now that just don't even take up more space than a chair in your house. And you can sit in the sauna and, and it causes perspiration, but it doesn't make a person feel super hot. So it works really well. And uh, that's a way to detox. So, you know, the colon hydrotherapy, like I mentioned, so there's at home ways, and then there's very specific, we're going to use the genetics, we're going to do toxin testing, and we're going to get very, very uh, pinpointed 
on what detoxification needs to happen for this person. In some cases, there's IV chelation that is needed. Other people don't need chelation. There, that would not be a good choice for them. So uh, there's there's a lot, so, so many different ways. Chelation doesn't have to be done by IV. It can be done orally or with a suppositories into the rectum. So there's it depends on what's in a person's body. So if people want to do testing, that's where I come in and design. And I'm, I know there's other practitioners like myself where we, we put together a program that's going to work for that particular person, depending on what their situation. Individualized care is essential. And, and if somebody's going to do the radiation, I mean, there's another something else. Most physicians, most oncologists, will tell people, don't take any vitamins, don't take any vitamins at all. And there are certain nutrients that will actually protect the person from radiation burns. Zinc is one of them. If a person has a good zinc status before they do radiation, they have much less radiation burning. A tiny amount of vitamin C is appropriate for that person. Not a lot, but a little bit. So moderating and dosing is important. Yeah, there's a whole long list of things. In fact, I've got lectures that I've done that are exactly all about what nutrients with cancer, what cancer what would you use? How much do you use at what point in the treatment? So Yeah, this is great, Cindy. Yeah. You've got a lot of resources. We're um we're just about out of time. So what's the best way for people listening to find you and get help? Okay. If people need to have assistance or they think they want a biochemist on their team, um, you can contact me uh, on the through the website. It's Dr. Sandy S A N D Y Bivagua B as in boy E Edward B Victor A C qua.com, drsandybavacqua.com, and the DR doesn't have a period after it, then you could also call the office. That would be okay. That was 520-743-0575. And that way you can, and what I'll do is for your listeners, I will offer a free 15-minute consult, which will need to be booked. And I, at least I could get you started. Once you tell me what you're dealing with and what your situation is, let me at least get you started in the right direction and give you an idea of what's available for you. So I'm happy to okay. do that. Um, I have a limited number of those appointments that are available each month, but uh, happily happily done. Uh, I'm happy to help people get started on that. And if you really do want a biochemist on your team, that's the thing that I do. Very good. Well, Dr. Cindy, thank you for coming back. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. You take care. Take good care of yourself. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.